Okay, so what we're going to start with is we're going to walk through a very brief tutorial on interacting with Snorkel. So I'm going to pull this out. Um, go ahead and open up your Workshop 1 um, Snorkel API notebook. All right, so if you guys go to um, Workshop 1 Snorkel API, So how many people are familiar with Jupyter Notebooks? I should ask right off. So the majority of people. Um, the way you interact with these, just for those who aren't familiar, um, you, let me see if I can make this a little bigger. Uh, yeah. You'll have this um, run button or uh, in an active cell, which is highlighted in blue. And you can just click run. And what it does is it lets you sort of walk through the notebook and run individual cells and sort of walk through your program and interact with um, your Python code. So if you guys go in and do that, make sure you proceed linearly through your notebook. Um, if you skip cells, uh, things won't work. So just make certain that you proceed with the, you know, run this, run this, run this. Sometimes if things are doing unusual stuff, uh, you may just want to restart the whole Jupyter notebook. In which case, you go up to here at File and just, or sorry, go up to Kernel and then say Restart and Clear Output. And that resets the notebook and you again go back up to the top and you can run cells from the beginning. Okay. So hopefully everyone's run this first um, cell here. Basically, this is super boring. All this is doing is setting up the connection to the database. And so you'll see some flavor of this in all the notebooks we look at today. But this is just connecting to some Postgres backend and setting up a Snorkel interface so they can query candidates and save stuff. Um, pretty standard. OK. So as I said earlier, uh, Snorkel in uh, the text setting formulates or on this idea of candidates, which we have defined as a pair of person names. More generally, this is just a pair of what we call uh, contexts. A context is just some uh, s part of a document or some part of a, a training instance. That can be in the person setting. It can be just subsequences of text or a span that maps to an entity. Um, it could be an entire sentence. It could be a paragraph. It could be an entire document. It's sort of flexibility in how you choose to define um, what your context look like. Here, we make the assumption that we are classifying over pairs of spans, go down here, pairs of spans that live inside a sentence. So that's our classification candidate. There is some generic setup that happens with, again, every Snorkel application. This is just defining a relation type, where again, our type is a spouse comprised of two people. And you just run this at the beginning of every notebook. It's problem specific. It's whatever you're, you know, you're writing an application over. But this sets it up so that you can interact with the candidate to write everything. Yep. Um, so is this like a convenience function that uh, you know, hides all this the span declaration and? Yeah, so I mean, uh, these are all convenience functions that sort of um, make it easier to access that information. So as, as Joy said at the start of the day, we've done a lot of like cooking show preparation of setting all this stuff up for you guys. That can be a non-trivial investment of time, but it's, you know, it, it's largely just boring engineering work and it's auxiliary to some of the snorkel ideas. Um, so my point was that if this was a different use case, right, if the container was not a spouse and something else, mm -hmm. Context for something else, right? You could not reuse this, right? That is correct. Not reuse this, sorry. You could not use, call it as candidate subclass and then ask the parameters. Probably without changing some code. But conceptually, you can define some candidate over context. So out of box, it would probably require a little engineering. But This particular helper function is generic. Okay. But the data that's fed into it, you know, would need. They just count it subclass helper. Okay, great questions. Um, in the setup, a span is just a subsequence of a sentence, it lives inside a sentence, and a sentence lives inside a document. So there's this context hierarchy that you can access in some way if you want to see other information in, say, a document or a sentence that a candidate lives inside. 
Okay. So um, the most uh, common setup thing we do here is we want to query our database to fetch a collection of candidates. In this sense, we want to. In this setting, we want to query to pull all of our potential training data. So this is a bunch of unlabeled candidates. The way this works is this this session query, and then you pass in the candidate um, object type, and then we filter um, to the split ID, which is just the idea ID of the specific training set we're looking at. And in our convention, split ID zero is the unlabeled training set. And if we go ahead and run that. Um, this, oops. Oh, yeah, I just made the mistake. I warned you guys not to do. Make sure you run everything in order. Um, if you don't, you'll get weird errors, which I just got there. All right, great. So I ran that, and that will now, if we were to show what's inside this, you can just see that it's some number of candidates, 22,000 potential spouse pairs. All right. Um, what do these candidate objects look like? This is a very cartoonish view of the interface, but it's just some spouse class, and it contains arguments that are named person one and person two, which map to spans, and that's just what defines the relation. And if you were to look you know, at the span itself, you have this helper function called get attrib tokens, and this is um, just an attribute parameter. This just allows you to access the words that live inside the span. And then parent lets you climb up that context hierarchy to go from span to sentence to document. Okay? All right, so I've given a few examples in this cell of just how we actually interact with this candidate. What am I doing? I'm taking that list of training data candidates I produced. I'm pulling the first one out, just naming it C. And then I'm accessing the various member method functions that give me information. So I'll go ahead and run this. What do we get? We see, you know, candidate zero or candidate, yeah, let's see, the first candidate. If we were to look at person one, person two, we'll see that it's a span um, for these two people names. We have some information like the unique sentence it lives in, the ID, and then we have the absolute character offsets where it lives inside the sentence. We can access um, specific attributes of individual arguments. So here, if we want to get the specific tokens, like the tokenized representation of that span, we can use the get a trip tokens for words, and you'll see that just returns a list of strings that defines the, the span. Then we can do the same thing for things like part of speech tags, if you're interested to you know, maybe find stuff like nouns or whatever. Um, and then we can also extract named entity tags uh, this would clearly, in this case, you know, our relation is defined over person names, so it makes sense that both of our, you know, spans, or at least for person one, are person names, but there are other tags too, like city names and businesses and all that stuff that you could access this way to use in your labeling function as needed. Yep? So, uh, for candidates, it makes sense that um, we're dealing with uh, an ordered list so person one and person two are not interchangeable because of their existence in the sentence, right? Right. Um, for the relation that we care about here, spouse goes either way, mm -hmm. and so that it is really, uh, it shouldn't be a directed relationship. Um, does that mean that we, is the relationship that we're training here inherently directed and we need a labeling function that will go back and given all the evidence of everything, uh, the, given what a labeling, other labeling functions have found, we would want to also say that the so, other direction is Yeah, open. so we can model asymmetric relationships. So this is assumed to be just symmetric. That's just something we've baked into our assumptions okay. when we generated this. You, it's just a literal flag to pass in to say that AB is the same as BA or different. Right. And then you can write your labeling functions based on the ordering that assumption. That was part of the early engineering yeah. part that we skipped over. Okay. The question mark? What, uh, setting that flag of the, the spousal Yeah, so again, there, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about at the, at the end, of the day, end of the day today or tomorrow. There are a bunch of advanced notebooks that show you how we define a candidate, how we process documents. 
um, but we've sort of put those to the side for the moment. But you have that flexibility. So, great. Yep. Yeah. Can you also customize the Neon model? Yeah, absolutely. So we just use the Spacey. If people are familiar with Spacey, we just use the Spacey tags generated there. But it's agnostic. You could pour in whatever you wanted. In fact, for most of these bio applications, you'll probably be using some custom tagger. Um, yeah, or a collection of regexes or something. But okay. Any other questions? This is great. Okay. Basically, these collection of functions here, if you write your own labeling functions without relying much on helper functions, which we'll talk about in just a sec, these are the types of functions you're interacting with um, to interface parts of the candidate. So, um, but as I just said, Often you find yourself doing the same exact thing over and over and over again. So there are these notion of just helper functions. They're really just convenience functions. It's part of this bigger idea that you know Snorkel is just an API for interacting and generating training data. So we've provided a number of common ones. This would be things like get all you know some number of tokens to the left of a relation, get some number of tokens to the right, um, get tokens between or get the text between. Those are sort of common places that you look for clues while writing labeling functions. So these are just functions that we can run right here. Again, passing in that same example uh, to see how we can access that information to inform how we write our labeling function. OK. So now what we're going to do is we're going to run through a couple exercises where we have you guys um, write an implementation in Python to return some information that is the types of stuff you may use for writing a labeling function. So this first one would be um, counting the number of tokens, the number of words that occur between a pair of arguments in a sentence. And the way this works is, I'll comment out, out the answer, but you run this, the first time you run it, it will be a little sluggish because behind the scenes it's querying to pull all of the candidates out. Um, but it only has to do that once and then it caches everything so it'll be much faster. So just let this run for like 10 seconds. And then of course I didn't provide a definition here. Um, so it's going to do bad uh, and not get anything correct. Do you guys have an idea how you'd solve this? Just shoots like a one-liner. Um. All waiting for that to work. It would look something like this. Okay, yep, so I got it wrong, obviously, but I've replaced it now with, uh, whoops, what did I do wrong here? Right. So uh, it would give you a list. So, but it, is that what you're asking? Sorry. You have to write your casting as a list. What is it before that? What's it returning? Just the get between tokens. So get between tokens returns a list of tokens, like words, basically. So we can actually let's print the output to show you guys. So it's a generator. So we wrap it up as a list. And it's just a list of everything that occurs between the arguments of the uh, um, that candidate. Okay. 
and there's a slight bug in my false percentage, but the correct thing here is this, this implementation. I don't think I cast it to a list properly in the quote unquote answer. So it's because if you ignore this, it's because I implemented, I didn't wrap it up in a generator. I didn't wrap the generator up properly, so it's doing some weird stuff. I have a correct answer in a helper file, and that correct answer is not correct. So yeah, yeah, this, this is correct. It's yeah. a noisy correct. It's a noisy correct, yeah. <laughs> So that's what's weird. So, oh, I see. I, yeah. So it's misspecified. So that's what the error is. So if you use this, this is the bug. Um, I'm returning characters that occurs between um, this. When I, I wrote length of token, so I bug. There are two different things, right? So that's why they don't give the right match. Yeah, so I mean, they should, theoretically, they work for the other two in my testing, but as long as you return the right type. So that's the, the trick there. Um, so text between returns tokens. Text between returns tokens, or text, get text between returns a string, and get uh, tokens between, or uh, yeah, get between tokens returns a list of tokens. So if you guys just want to, um, you know, attempt two and three on your own and ask questions, that's, and then, you know, maybe give you a couple of minutes to do that, and then we'll just walk through the answers. Okay, so we'll walk through two. So this is an interesting, so um, for two, it's pretty straightforward, right? You're just checking membership in the list of all the tokens that occur between these two names, right? Um, you'll note here that I, uh, uh, I implemented this the first time, and I here did a set membership approach, where I just ask if this married term occurs in the set of tokens. While well, the answer I did married if it occurs in a normalized string, right? And you'll need that those give very slightly different answers. So, um, but largely the same. This one's probably the most complicated. So maybe let's walk through this third example just because it is a little um, more involved. Basically what I'm doing is I asked, how do we check to see if the pair of people names have the same last name? Well, I accept a candidate in this helper function. I index that candidate at zero or one. That's one way to access the arguments, right, of the candidate. Another way is to actually use its name, which is what that um, candidate subclass thing defined. This is the same way to get to these things. In practice, when you guys are writing your notebook stuff, it's usually more convenient to say chemical disease as the arguments. I get a trib tokens. I just want the words that comprise that span. I do that for both arguments. And then I say, well, if you know, as I define this, I'm going to ignore if the length of the people's names in terms of tokens is one in either case, or if they're the exact same mention of a name. I'll just punt on that. I'll say, or I'll say it's false. But if the last token in a sequence of a person's name matches in person one and person two, I'll say that's you know the same last name matches. Yeah. 
So that's an assumption, right? So that's a noisy, not always going to be right, um, but it's you know to first order assumption more often than not true. Okay. So, um, as you guys are wrapping that up, I'll just point out that it's useful to keep this API document open in the background, just so that you can refer back to it. Um, there's a cheat sheet. If you're in the Jupyter Notebook, you can actually use this helper function here, where you use a function name. I'll just go ahead and show you what this does. If you prepend a function name with a question mark and run it, it gives you um, some information about the arguments that function accepts, so and some documentation for the doc string. So it's a convenient way to see, you know, if you forget what a function needs as input, you can check that way. Um, we've also listed uh, there is some documentation in this read the documents link. Basically. For your guys' purposes, you can restrict yourself to this set of member functions. That should be enough to do quite a bit for what we'll talk about today and tomorrow. Um, and then we'll show in the next notebook there are some additional helper objects that make writing labeling functions a little easier. And the last sort of bit is if you're interested in what's available to you in the sentence, right? You have, of course, the words, which you guys have, we've interacted with you know, in this notebook. But you can also access things like lemmas, which is like the base word without you know, any inflections, part of speech tags, NER tags. And then you can get you know, like things like syntax trees, which I recommend we don't look at, um, and things like the absolute offsets in the sentence. It's all available to you in the, in the sentence object. All right? Great.